My talk this morning is titled The REM State, Kytextia, and the Development of Self Concept. And I want to relate these three things together. And I'm going to start by reminding you of a line of poetry that you may have learned in your A levels or O levels. Great wits to madness are near allied, and not a hair's breadth that the two divide. It's long been noted that there has been and is a connection between madness and creativity, between genius and madness. Research all around the world has shown Nobel Prize winners, whether in the arts or the sciences, have an extraordinary amount of mental illness in their families. If these often creative geniuses themselves haven't suffered from mental illness, then you can be pretty certain there's above average levels of mental illness in their close offspring. And that's a piece of knowledge that's been well known. Less well known has been the work of Professor Michael Fitzgerald at Trinity College Dublin, a uh, professor of psychiatry there. But over the last number of years, he has written a number of stunning books on the relationship between creativity and autism. And he has shown, and if you read the books he has written, I don't think any reasonable person can doubt the connection he has established. And when you read the profiles of the personalities that he's looked at, it is quite clear that civilization would not have existed without Asperger syndrome, or a tendency at least in that direction. For example, famous people who are, have been diagnosed as actually having suffered from Asperger's include the greatest, allegedly the greatest scientist who ever lived in the Western world at any rate, Isaac Newton. More recent times, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin, where would we be in biology without Darwin? In other areas too, not just science, for example, Stanley Kubrick, film director, Joy Anderson in the area of uh, nature studies, in the area of philosophy, Ludwig Wittgenstein, in the area of novels, James Joyce, Nobel Prize winning poet William Butler Yeats, great physicist Kurt Vodell, in the area of politics, Sir Keith Joseph and E.F. Powell meet the criteria for Asperger's syndrome. So on the face where there's an apparent contradiction there, is there not? On the one hand, the evidence shows quite clearly there's a connection between schizophrenia, psychotic, manic depression and genius. On the other hand, we now have a very clear connection between autism and genius. And yet these two very conditions appear to contradict each other because psychotism is, is about, that tendency in that direction is about strong imaginations. The REM state, create, you know, getting, into, getting into the imaginative mind. Whereas when we look at Asperger's and autism, we're looking at the opposite. We're looking at people obsessed by concrete reality. How can they both be linked to genius when they're the direct opposite of each other? Now, as pioneering as Michael Fitzgerald's research has been, he has not addressed that particular question, but it does remain an anomaly. But one I think that's fairly easily reconcilable if one starts to think about it in more depth. It's clear that for creativity, we do need a strong imagination. We do need to be able to imagine what hasn't yet come into human awareness. But it's also true that for real creativity to be there, there has to be an obsessive interest. There has to be an incredible focus, an incredible inquiring mind, the ability to pursue a question irrespective of public acclaim at whatever price. So for real creativity to take place, we need elements of autism and elements of the psychotic mind, the highly imaginative mind, disciplined by a very strong, rational, almost autistic mindset. So for real genius, I suspect, is the marrying of those two tendencies together in balance. But of course, it's hard for nature to keep things in balance because genes are continually being remixed in every generation. And so not surprisingly, we will find that the mix goes slightly awry. And perhaps people who have a slightly stronger imagination, albeit an original one, if it's maybe drawn towards the arts, and if it's not sufficiently disciplined by the logical mindset, may well have a tendency towards psychotic illnesses. On the other hand, a person with a very strong focused mind that's not balanced by an imaginative mind, we may well be looking at some tendency towards Asperger syndrome. So, quite possibly, we need both of, elements from both of these 
mindsets to produce genius. However, in the general population, you don't find schizophrenia and autistic disorders correlated. A family member with autism in that family, you're no more likely to get schizophrenia than you are in the general population, or in, the general po or in a family that's got uh, patients suffering from manic depression or schizophrenia, you're no more likely to get an autism than you are in the general population. But I strongly suspect that for real creativity, the two do tend to run together in families. And that's why you know, high levels of creativity and genius are perhaps so rare, because you've got to get both the mindsets running simultaneously and reasonably in balance, at least for some part of the person's life, in order to produce great creative insights. I could give you lots of examples of families of genius where you've got both mindsets. But just off the top of my head, I just mentioned um, James Joyce, for example, uh, meets the criteria for Asperger's, yet he had a schizophrenic daughter, for example. Uh, the philosopher, uh, Russell the philosopher, for example, uh, he, had, he was autistic, or Asperger's, and um, he had two children who suffered with schizophrenia just a couple of examples off the top of my head, where in genius you do get the two mindsets, the autistic mindset and the, and the imaginative, uh, potentially psychotic mindset coming together. So that's by way of an introductory idea to the talk I'm going to give today about the connection between the REM state, kytexty, and the development of self-concept. Asperger's. Called after Dr. Asperger. Uh, and during the Second World War, uh, Asperger... Dr. Asperger was working and investigating a, a unique group of people who nowadays would be recognized perhaps as very high performing autistic people. And he described children with this syndrome, which wasn't then called Asperger's, he called it autis, autism. Just as a colleague of his in America at the same time, Kanner was working at children with more severely disabled, and he also used the term autism. But what Asperger's children, though, that he was studying, were, and adults, were much more intelligent than average. He described these children as young professors, little professors, he said. That's what they were like, these Asperger children. They were like little professors. And he said sometimes they were extraordinarily gifted and even close to genius in terms of the intelligence that they displayed. And yet they were very odd socially, found it difficult, relationships very, very difficult, odd and eccentric and bizarre behaviours in this group of people. Um, subsequently, uh, a researcher here in London, Lorna Wing, uh, decided to call this group of patients Asperger after Dr. Asperger himself, and hence the term Asperger. Today, the criteria that are recognized as defining the syndrome are as follows. Qualitative impairment in social interaction is manifested by at least two of the following. So we have to have Two out of this list, marked impairments in the use of multiple nonverbal behaviours such as eye-to-eye -eye gaze, facial expression, body postures, and gestures to regulate social interaction. Failure to develop peer relationships appropriate to, development, to their developmental level. Finding it easier to make friends with children than with adults, for example. A lack of spontaneous seeking to share the enjoyment, interests, or achievements with other people. For example, by a lack of showing, bringing, or pointing out objects of interest to other people. Lack of social or emotional reciprocity. And then the B list, we have to have uh, one out of the B list. Restricted, repetitive, and stereotype patterns of behaviour, interests, activities manifested by at least one of the following. An encompassing preoccupation with one or more stereotyped or restricted patterns of interest to a level that would be regarded as, you know, abnormal. An apparently inflexible adherence to specific non-functional routines or rituals, and perhaps stereotyped or repetitive motor mechanisms, hand or finger flapping, twisting, or complex whole body movements. Maybe a persistent preoccupation with parts of objects. And then, if those uh, conditions are present, the disturbance also has got to cause clinically significant impairment in working life or in home life and the symptoms must fit that description better than any other disorder. Now, interestingly, several commentators have said that the patients described by Asperger would not meet these diagnostic criteria. Isn't that remarkable? That the patients that Asperger described, when people have gone back and looked at his descriptions, they would not actually meet these diagnostic criteria. They're too rigid and too inflexible. And it is quite possible for these young professors, these little professors that Asperger was describing, that you mightn't 
have all of these, are sufficient of these characteristics there, but nonetheless, albeit gifted youngsters and people, there are significant difficulties in making relationships in perceiving connections and relationships between things. So let's look at the current prevailing theories that seek to explain Asperger's. The pioneer here in the field is Uta Frith. The first theory which he formulated was something called central coherence theory. And this would be uh, shown, for example, if a young person or an adult were told a story and then asked to repeat the gist of the story, you'd find that the person with Asperger's would get bogged down in the detail of the story and wouldn't actually be able to pull together the main theme of the story. They'd get caught up in the details of the story. And so she said they had weak central coherence. But she also developed another theory along with her student, Simon Baron Cohen. Another theory to explain Asperger's, which was the theory of mind, which was the idea that people with this condition are unable, are missing a module that enables them to read the mindset, what other people are thinking and feeling. So this is the theory of mind. Currently, Uta Fritz says that her major problem now is to find a deeper theory that can link these two theories together. And that's what I hope to present here this morning, is the deeper theory that can link these two theories together. A third theory that's currently getting a lot of attention and quite fashionable is Simon Baron Cohn's and Hand Asperger's theory, because Asperger himself put forward this theory, and then it's been resurrected more recently by Simon Baron Cohn, which is that Asperger's is the extreme of the male brain. That what we're looking at is the male brain taken to an extreme, that the male brain tends towards looking for patterns and systems and explanations, and that the female brain tends to predominantly be interested in making relationships and empathy. And so that Asperger is the extreme end of the male brain mindset. Actually, that isn't really an explanation of anything. It's just a description of something that happens to be true. That the male brain is more systems oriented on average, and the female brain is more empathy oriented. But it doesn't actually explain anything. It's just a description of a statistical fact, so to speak. But nonetheless, useful in a way, because it can be a way of helping people approach the problems of Asperger's. Quite a useful way. And, that's, and I do recommend his book. The Essential Difference, fabulous book. None of those theories, we believe, are sufficient to explain the range of phenomena encountered in Asperger's. And Uta Frit, as I said, herself suspects there's a deeper theory needed that can pull these things together. So, we've introduced the term kytextia as the name for a deeper theory that we believe pulls all these together more satisfactorily. We developed the term kytextia from the Latin word caicus meaning blindness and contextus meaning context. Because we believe that what's actually missing in Asperger's is the ability to perceive the deeper context in which facts are embedded, in which perceptions are embedded. It's actually an accurate description, we believe, of what underlies Asperger's. Also, we felt a need for another term as well, because this term as well, for two reasons. One is the term Asperger's is now being applied as a diagnostic label to such a wide range of people and children. Children with IQs as low as 60 are now being termed Asperger's rather than autistic. And surely if you're going to have a term that describes professors of physics at Cambridge and children with an IQ of 60 with the same term, it's ridiculous. It's, abs it's absurdity. So we certainly need a more accurate term. And we believe Kytextia meets the bill, or at least... Put it, we put it forward as meeting the bill. So kytextia then is context blindness and it's caused by an inability to keep track of multiple interconnecting variables and to reprioritize any change in those variables by referring to or calling upon a wider field of knowledge that contains the history of them. In other words, everything is embedded in a deeper context and there's a failure to perceive that deeper context. This causes people with kytextia to resort to one of two main modus operandi. One is logical straight line thinking, seeing everything in black and white. Or alternatively, some people may manifest this, a problem with seeing context with showing 
hyper-associational mind, where they're continually running from one thing that's somehow connected to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, and their thought processes are undisciplined by reason. And so you try and rationalize and reason with them, and they seem to be with you, and the next thing they produce an association that totally uh, is incompatible with the conclusion you've been at a moment ago, but the brain is off in a new direction, but there's somehow a connection between that and the previous thing. So this hyper-associationalism, this would be the two ways where we have observed this kytexia to manifest itself. Over the past several years, Ivan and I are doing the diploma course. And as you know, we get patients in on the diploma course. And very often, they're the patients who have had extreme difficulties hitherto because people don't refer them to us until they are sick and tired of them themselves. And, <laughs> and, and they usually have gone through several hands by the time they end up in front of myself and I, which is not the ideal situation with trainee therapists to present very intimidating cases, but it's a question of needs must, if that's what's, because it takes a lot of courage, perhaps desperation, to go and put yourself in front of a group of people and have therapy at the same time. So, during the last few years, we saw a significant percentage of the patients who had a history of failing to respond to therapy, who were ending up in our diploma courses for us to do therapy with, were clearly showing kytextia clearly showing a context blindness. Sometimes of the left brain, shall we say, the, the logical black and white linear thinking mode, and sometimes of the hyper-associational mode. Now I want to give you some examples of what we would call kytextic behavior. Just hopefully that you will recognize the inadequacies of the existing theories and see the need for something deeper by way of an explanation here. An Asperger man that I knew rather well would comb his hair or brush his hair, but it would never occur to him to brush the back of it, even though this was an outstandingly intelligent man. Somehow or other, all that existed for him was the, what was concretely in front of him. And the back of his head wasn't concretely in front of him, so it didn't exist. Uh, another friend of mine who is Asperger's and also incredibly intelligent, talented man, described how being presented on his birthday with a box of chocolates for, by his wife before going out for dinner together, that as she went upstairs to get ready, she said to this man, oh, eat, uh, help yourself to that box, you know? And so he took the box and started to eat it. And when she came downstairs, she got angry. So why on earth are you eating a car? Well, you said eat the box. You said help yourself to the box. You didn't say help yourself to the chocolates. The chocolates weren't invisible. They're inside the box. What was visible was the box, help yourself to the box, so she started to eat the box. This man is outstandingly intelligent. But what isn't in front of him doesn't exist. How can you say that's not reading mindsets? Driving through red traffic lights. Another friend of mine and colleague, erstwhile colleague, I was driving through London with him, and again, Asperger's. Driving to London with him, and uh, he was slowing the car down as we approached red traffic lights. When I noticed that we were in the wrong lane, that we needed to turn right. Straight away, he drove through the red traffic lights and started to turn right, only to meet an oncoming stream of traffic that nearly annihilated us. So here we see there is this factor, stimulus in the environment, the red traffic lights. Yes, you're supposed to stop at it. But as soon as this other variable is introduced, that we have to turn right, somehow or other, the two of them can't be held together and prioritise which is the more important right now. The red traffic light are, turning, are being in the wrong lane. If you could go into his imagination and say, well, what's the consequences of driving through the red traffic light? You would then have been able to picture the traffic coming from the other direction and killing us. But somehow or other, there's the inability to go into the REM state, to go into the imaginative mind, and to look at the consequences and reprioritize. And so he drives right into the oncoming traffic. This is not a, simply about reading other people's minds. It's about variables and how to interact and prioritizing them. A woman who presented for therapy, and Ivan was her therapist on the diploma course, we felt met uh, the criteria for kytextia. And the presenting problem that she showed was that she was converted to an Eastern religion, Buddhism, I think, if I remember correctly. And her mother was Catholic and lived on the continent. And she now felt that she could never visit her mother again because her mother was old and she couldn't tell her that she changed religion. This would cause far too much dis 
distress to her mother. At the same time, she was heartbroken at the thought she could never meet her mother again. And she had arrived by train, and Ivan used a very, very simple metaphor with her about how on railway tracks you have this mechanism that can switch the train from one track to another, and you can go, you can go on that track, and that later on it may even rejoin the original track. And by using that simple metaphor, which she readily grasped, Ivan used that to put down a pattern in her mind that she could go to the continent and visit her mum, and whilst there, act in the Catholic mode. Without saying that anything about her Eastern approach, that's a different track. So whilst with your mum, be a Catholic, because that won't cause her stress, but you'll get your emotional needs met in meeting your mum without upsetting her. And then when you're away from your mum, you're on the other track of being a Buddhist. This was like enlightenment to this highly intelligent woman, that you could actually be two different things in two different places, as it were. But you see this the straight line black and white thinking that said, you know, if, I, if I'm going to espouse Buddhist philosophy, I have to do it wherever I am, whenever I am, irrespective of who it hurts. So clearly, the established theories really don't explain that range of phenomena. But the idea that there's a deeper, there's a deeper context in which things occur, and understanding that deeper context enables people to have much more flexible judgments does explain the whole range from not being able to read minds to not being able to reprioritize, put, put the essential points of a story together to why you might be inclined to go for systems thinking because systems thinking means that you hold all the variables fixed and you only allow two of them to change. So really, scientific, the scientific paradigm is designed for aspergers because you hold all the context. What you do in science is you eliminate context and you only allow two variables to change. So it's, it's a mindset designed for Asperger. So of course people with this mindset will be drawn towards systems thinking. We've got that far, the idea that Asperger was about the failure to perceive the context that's not in front of you, the deeper, the deeper relationships in which things are embedded. But to be able to tie this down in a more concrete way was desirable. And one morning, my daughter, Lily Beth, who, as all my family are aware, know that I have an interest in dreams. And so she came down one morning, and she knows it's a good way to get Daddy's attention, is telling me I had a dream. So she comes down one morning, and says, Daddy, I had a fascinating dream. And of course, she had my rapt attention. I said, well, what was that, Lily Beth? She said, I dreamt I was dancing with horses. We were in a nightclub, and we were dancing with horses. All my girlfriends, and we were all dancing with these horses, and it was great, and it was lovely. And this horse asked me out to dinner, and I'm wondering, you know, is this a date? And it is, and we're actually going to be going out together? Well, what struck me straight away was the acceptance of dancing with horses. It's not that dissimilar to the acceptance of it's appropriate to eat a cardboard box. In fact, it's one and the same process. So in dreams, we're kytextic. In dreams, we don't see context. In dreams, we accept the reality of the dream because we don't see the, the deeper context. The deeper context is, of course, the knowledge of horses. Horses cannot dance. Horses do not go to nightclubs. Horses do not speak. And most sane girls do not date them. <laughs> Although it has been said that many women have closer relationships with their horses than they have with their husbands, but that's another matter. <laughs> Well, they certainly don't go out on dates and nightclubs with them dancing. That's an information base that was in Lady Beth's brain, but wasn't available to her at the time of the dream. So, straight away that pointed to what the mechanism was in Asperger's. That in the, we believe the dream because the background information about the stimuli is cut off. And that's what's happening in Asperger's. When people are in a context, if they're suffering with Asperger's chytextia, the background information about the stimuli is cut off. They're not getting access to it. But of course, that background information isn't concretely present. And in order to get access to it, you've got to be able to go into your imagination, into the REM state. So somehow or other, the REM state must be cut off in chytextia. Access to it at any rate. So thinking about this then, the missing background information that is available in our brain somehow gets suspended in dreaming and in chytextia. And what was the purpose of that background information, I wondered? Why, did it, why, why is it there? What 
conditions might have led to its the development of a tool in the brain, if you will, that holds together and makes available the background information for stimuli. Where does this come from? Just to give you a flavour drawn from another area of life, of what, I, what, what I suspect it might be like to be kytextic. I think if you take, as an analogy, a poor sense of direction. Now let me hasten to add there is no connection between a poor sense of direction and kytextia. If one has a poor sense of direction, it is a disability in its own way. Mostly, as long as you stay in your familiar environment, of course, you, know, you, you, you learn your bearings and your way around, and it never shows itself. It's only when you go into unfamiliar territory that a poor sense of direction becomes apparent. But 99 times percent of one's life, it's totally, one's totally unaware of it. But if you, if you do, like I do, spend a lot of time in strange hotels, you very quickly become aware of it. Because what happens is that when you come out of your bedroom in the morning, you invariably turn in the wrong direction. It is not that you turn in the right direction 50% of the time, it's that you turn in the wrong direction 100% of the time. <laughs> and, and what's actually happening there is, there's a module in the brain, that, in these, some people's brains, that prints a map, an orientation map, of where they are in space. And that map reconfigures itself depending where they are. Whereas in my brain, when I come out of the hotel bedroom in the morning, that reconfiguration hasn't taken place. If it did, I'd reorientate myself correctly to walk backwards to the reception. But what's imprinted in my brain is the original map where I was heading. And of course, you recognize the direction where you were heading, and so you invariably turn in the wrong direction. So, a poor sense of direction, then, is, is if you like, a module or a little brain capacity that reorientates the body in space. If, that may not be as highly developed in some people as it is in others. It's a, a minor disability unless you spend the rest, most of your time in strange places. And one can learn to compensate anyway. Once you realize that one has this difficulty, you can, you can consciously impress upon yourself where the reception is, etc., and you can learn to counteract it. And most hotels are aware of and they've got big signs saying, reception this way for people like me. So we do eventually find our way out. So I think that being kytextic is a bit like being handicapped in that sense. Whilst on the one hand, there may be giftedness going with kytextic, incredible powers of concentration, intelligence, analytical skills. On the other hand, they are not orientating themselves to the deeper context that they find themselves in life. And that can be hugely difficult and lead to all kinds of difficult decision making and difficulties in relationships, etc., etc. Now, I was saying that where would this ability to orientate ourselves into context, to see the deeper context in situations have arisen from? Evolution doesn't just suddenly produce things. There is, I believe, a background of pressure, if you like, building up why things evolve. They don't just come from nowhere. And I believe that we can see the conditions very quickly where the evolutionary pressure came from to develop the ability to see deeper context. And it would have arisen once animals got hot-blooded. Once animals develop hot-bloodedness, that gave them tremendous flexibility because prior to that, all animals had to lie and wait for the sun to come up and to absorb energy from the sun before they could really do anything. But once hot-bloodedness developed, we had an internal body temperature. So at any time, we can just get up and go. We're in the middle of the night, where the sun is totally absent. It introduced tremendous flexibility into animals. And mammals, of course, maybe the dinosaurs, we don't know, but certainly mammals were uh, amongst the first two creatures to have this internal body control temperature, and so do birds descended from dinosaurs. Now, the problem, though, with developing an internally controlled temperature so that you can act at any moment is that it takes an awful lot of calories to keep that energy available on constant body heat. In fact, it required a 500% increase in calorie intake. Now, that was a hugely intellectually demanding task that was put before mammals to be able to find 500% more calories than they had before they got body control temperatures. And one of the requirements of doing that was not to waste this energy, energy conservation. Because once you've got energy instantly available, the temptation will be to run every way with it. But this energy now has to be earned. And so it's going to be very important energy conservation. And so the brain, our nature needed to develop an energy conservation strategy in animals. And that was why the cortex started to grow in, in mammals in particular. The cortex started to grow. As uh, Donald MacLean, and MacLean, the great pioneer of the triune brain concept, described the cortex, he said, it's as though nature was inventing an objective taken reality. 
to be able to let animals see things more objectively. And so as not to waste energy pursuing every impulse that can. This objective intake enables the emotional, instinctive brain to be suppressed. So we don't run after every emotional impulse so as we don't waste energy. But the problem, of course, with that suppressing energy like that, suppressing impulses, was what did you do to suppress impulses? Because after a while they'd build up and build up and the next thing there would be so many of them trying to get out that the animal would become totally pulled every direction, totally stressed out. Not only that, if you suppress impulses, you're going to interfere with emotions, the emotional templates. So, of course, the REM state was enveloped in dreaming. In order to discharge these impulses safely and maintain the integrity of the emotional responses, as we know. So, the REM state developed. So, that's how the REM state came in in hot bloodedness. But part of that conservation of energy would also have required the animal to be able to use this higher intelligence to be able to context read, to be able to evaluate, is it worth expending this energy following this impulse? What other variables are at play here? So that they, because you don't want to waste energy, so expensively got. So a rustle in the bushes, what does it mean? Does it mean for the cat there's a mouse there? Well, I'll go chase it. Wouldn't it be much better if the cat could just pause and say, let's have a look at context here. Rustle in the bushes, what could be there causing that that I'm not seeing? Is it necessarily a mouse? If the REM state could be clicked into and past examples of running, out, running into the bushes where there was nothing there because the leaves were disturbed by the wind, could actually put a completely different take on the significance of that stimulus and maybe indicate that it would be better not to rush after because the chances are it isn't a mouse. So there would have been an evolutionary pressure at the same time as REM sleep was developed for the ability to read context. What we have called elsewhere parallel processing seeing the things that are there, but also parallel processing things that are not obviously there, but could be having a bearing on this. So parallel processing, and that is the ability to read context, and the REM state would have come into being at the same time, at the time when hot-bloodedness developed. I've mentioned that we saw kytextia expressing itself in two directions. What we would think of as left-brain kytextia, maybe, and right-brain, although We'll see a little later that these terms maybe need to be looked at and revised somewhat. Now, having put forward, I think, a very reasonable case with the, with, to you this morning about kytextia, about the failure to read context being a more satisfying explanation for Asperger's than the prevailing theories. In fact, the prevailing theories are specific examples of kytextia. They are not the underlying theory. But it would be good, would it not, if we could actually show some physiological evidence of it, not just psychological evidence, but physiological evidence that this parallel processor actually exists and that its functioning is actually problematical in left-brain kytextia and problematical in right-brain kytextia. And I believe such evidence is available to us. There's been great excitement since 2001 in the field of neuropsychology by the discovery of a completely hitherto unknown pattern in the brain. A pattern that's probably more important than the left-right brain division that we're also familiar with. It was a discovery of what's been called, for want of a better term, the brain's default network. Now, what this discovery is, is that when people are not doing anything with their brain, far from their brain relaxing, they actually burn a lot more energy when they relax. Not only that, but there's a specific network of organs connected up when people relax. And it burns 30% more calories than when you're actually focused externally. There's an extraordinary amount of work going on in the brain when people relax. And a very specific network is wired up in the brain. And as soon as you're focused outwards, that network is switched off. So there's two networks that work in opposite directions in the brain. The frontal cortex here frontal prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate gyrus, both left and right brain, when we focus outwards is activated on the outwards environment. But as soon as we relax and focus inwards, that gets switched off and this default network gets switched on, which burns a huge amount of calories. It's a very, very busy network indeed. The default network is most active when engaged in internally focused tasks, including autobiographical memory, imagining the future, and conceiving the perspective of others. I want to give you a reference, which you might wish to take a note of, because 
Or the next half an hour, I'm going to be mentioning research that involves dozens and dozens of paper and, uh, papers, and I can't really reference them all for you here, although when we write it up, it will be referenced. But I want to give you a good review reference if you want to follow up on this. And it's the Brain's Default Network, published in 2008 by R. L. Buckner et al. in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, volume 1124, pages 1 to 38. And I'm giving you that because it's a good over, overlook at the whole area, but also it's free to download off the internet. It's 38 pages in the paper, but it's free to download from the internet. Here it is for you, some pictures of the brain. PET scans and MRI scans are used to detect this. Uh, this here is the outside, left outside of the brain. The purple is the default network, and the blue, the blue is the parts that are focused when we're externally focused, that are activated. You can't have the two of them switched on at the same time, not usually anyway. So, the default network is using something called the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior singlet. In fact, the default network is basically this middle portion of the brain going from front to back. That's the default network, going from the front to the back. Whereas the externally focused network is across the brain here. It's the lateral frontal cortex. And when one is switched on, the other is switched off and vice versa. Here is some images autobiography. When you see the default network uh, activated here, that's the inside of the brain, where you can see it better than you can from the outside of the brain. And you can see again, this, this is the medial brain, from the, from the middle of the brain here. You can see where it involves this middle of the brain slice. The, the, uh, what's called the posterior singlet. You'll all be familiar with the anterior singlet, because that's the boss's secretary. That actually disciplines and enables you to focus upon specific stimuli in, 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 here. Whereas the posterior singlet is, is what's involved in the default network. And that's much more about looking at possibilities and uh, and, and, and choices, etc., etc., and the medial brain, which is very much active in dreaming. Now, that's caused tremendous excitement. Uh, the idea that we have a really active network in the brain that only switches on when we are not focused in the outside environment. It's not just been discovered in humans, it's also been discovered in monkeys, and I expect parallels will be found in all mammals that are hot blooded. It, curiously, in humans, though, the default network part of the cortex is highly expanded and developed, as is the frontal cortex. These are the two parts uh, that are uniquely human, really expanded in the human brain. The ability to focus externally and the ability to go into the imagination are highly expanded in the human cortex compared to other primates. Now, here's an interesting little study in its own right, one that's, I think, of some import. Using MRI scans, volunteers were showing meaningless words and interspersed with the meaningless words were real words. And when they saw the real words, the default system switched on momentarily. And when people were asked, you know, what was going on there, for example, the real word Apple might have done, and people's default system would switch on, and their mind would have wandered from Apple to Apple Pie to Cinnamon. In other words, to the deeper context. This default system is producing the deeper context that we're saying is switched off in Asperger's. Now, if our theory of kytexty is correct, then this default system should be defective in people with Asperger's. It shouldn't, when people with Asperger's stop focusing on the external environment, this default system should not really switch on, or at least switch on much less than it does in people not suffering from this condition. If our analysis is correct, it's a failure to access this deeper context, the par this parallel processing that lies at the root in Asperger's, then this default system shouldn't switch on, or at least be much less active. Is it? The answer is yes. When patients with kytexia, when patients with Asperger's are examined in MRI scans, etc., and then they're allowed to relax, unlike people who are not Asperger's, the default system doesn't switch on. The parallel processor doesn't switch on. If you want the reference for that, it's called Failing to Activate Resting Functional Abnormalities in Autism, D.P. Kennedy et al., 2006. You'll pick it up from the other reference anyway that I gave, if you get the, the first reference. 
So now, let's think about, could there be a connection between the parallel processor and the REM state? Remember we've said, we, we identified that really to be able to get this deeper context, to do this parallel processing, really you need to go into the REM state. And we've, anyway, we've hypothesized that the REM state <coughs> and dreaming and this parallel process would have come into in, 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 into material existence at the same time as hoploading it. So one would anticipate there's a connection between the parallel processor and the REM state. This default system, what we call the parallel processor, it now turns out is not just only providing the background, deeper context to stimuli focus, when we focus on the external environment. We also use it when we imagine the future, when we're reading other people's minds, and when we go into personal memory. So of course it's the REM state. What else can it be other than the REM state? So the brain's default system, the parallel processor that we've said is missing in Kytextia, and the REM state have to be one and the same thing. Does that make sense? Look at the jobs it's doing. We've hypothesized that, that it's when we've got conscious access to the REM state, i.e. daydreaming. That's when civilization really took off. Because we could imagine things that didn't exist. We could invent language for... Words for the future, because we can imagine a future. Words for things that are not in our current environment, etc., etc. So complex language, all that, depends upon being able to go into the imagination. So the, accessing the imagination, the ability to perceive deeper context, the ability to people's, read people's minds, are all dependent upon being able to go into your imagination to perceive what's not there. Now... We use the term the REM state, but really sometimes we need to sort of clarify because there's a little ambiguity here. What do we actually mean by the REM state? In the sense that the REM state as detected in dreaming at night time, the REM state would include the firing of the orientation responses from the brain stem, the body paralysis, etc. That, that, if you like, is the machinery needed to trigger off the REM state or the reality simulator at night time, the theater for dreaming. So there's a difference, shall we say, between the parts of the brain that would activate the theater in dreaming and the actual accessing the theatre itself. Our, our, our hypothesis for some years now, and we've written about it in our books, is that that reality theatre can be accessed not only at night time through firing off the orientation responses, but that we can access it during the daytime through daydreaming, obviously. So, it's the ability to get into that mental theatre of the mind that's compromised in Asperger. However, in drawing this parallel between the default system or the parallel processor and the reality simulator of the REM state, there does seem to be a little contradiction. Because remember, I said that when Larry Beth was dreaming the dream about horses, she was kytextic because she couldn't see the background. So how can we say the REM state is a parallel processor if when we're dreaming we're, we're kytextic? Can you see there's a little contradiction there? Good. The contradiction is resolvable once you realize that there's a difference between the theatre, the REM state, and the script that's been running. In a theatre, you can run any play you like. You can put on all the works of Shakespeare, or you can put on a modern dramatist. You can put on who you like. But once you put a drama on at a specific time, that's the only bloody drama you can have on. So, that's what's happening. The REM state itself is a potential accessor of all our knowledge. But once you decide upon a dream script and run it, you then focus attention and you become kytextic. So the dream is kytextic, but the REM state is a parallel processor. It has potentially access to all of our knowledge. But once you run a specific script during the dream, you're now locking attention, so you're kytextic. So that resolves that problem. I started out, if you really recall, about talking about the psychotic genius being related, being related to psychotic illnesses, about Asperger's being related to genius. I want to come back now to this, what we might have thought of in terms of right-brained, imaginative mindset, and the dangers there of heading towards psychotic illnesses and creativity. I want to come back to that for a few moments. As you know, the human givens theory of psychosis, which is increasingly widely respected and supported in various quarters, is that Psychosis is the perception of reality through the, dream, through the dreaming brain, through the REM state. That in psychosis, we're not switching off the REM state and we're perceiving reality through the REM state. 
um, we're actually experiencing phenomena that would normally be experienced in a dream state are now being experienced while the person is awake. It's totally normal to hear voices in dreaming, but not whilst you're awake if people aren't present. It's totally normal to see things that are not there in the dream, but it's questionable the usefulness of this if you're awake. So believing fantastic notions ungrounded in reality is perfectly possible and acceptable in the dream state, but not quite so useful in the waking state. So the notion is then that psychosis arises from stress in perhaps people who are highly imaginative, that enough stress and we start triggering off the dream state phenomena whilst we're awake. Is there any evidence, would this have a bearing on this research? Is there any evidence to support this from this line of research? Well, if the serious psychosis is right, there's a clear prediction to be made here. Just as we would predict that the default system fails to switch on in kytextia, in Asperger's, we would also predict that the default system fails to switch off in people who are prone to psychotic illnesses. That's what the theory implies. And what actually happens when they study schizophrenics? Does the default system fail to switch off? And the answer is yes, exactly as predicted from Human Gibbons' theory. Schizophrenics, and not just schizophrenics, and this is very important, but they're close relatives. The default system stays switched on when they're focused on external reality. In other words, they're in the REM state, they're in the reality simulator at the very same time as they're processing external reality. We're seeing in kytextia, that is the underlying problem in Asperger's, we're seeing a failure to read the deeper context, that they're unable to dip into the history of all the variables they're interacting, to see how things could change. And so they're doing straight line thinking, and trapped in straight line thinking. We're seeing that when we're going towards people on the, heading towards a psychotic mindset, we're seeing the reverse problem. We're seeing that they are getting trapped in the imaginative mind, to the exclusion of focusing enough on the concrete reality in front of them. Now, if you are trapped in the imaginative mind, and remember the imaginative mind has all got to do with your own autobiographical memory, etc., etc., and you're not focusing enough on external reality, the consequences will be that you will be, in terms of, for a start, in terms of your self-concept, the, co the person who is very much stuck in their imaginative mind is going to not check the reality of their self-concept against external reality very much because it isn't intruding into, the, in, in, into their consciousness enough. So they're likely to have grandiose notions about themselves. They may have weird and fantastical notions. That would be the danger because they're not getting checked enough against reality. They will not really, they will appear kytextic as well and will not be really able to read other people's mindsets because they're going to be so focused on their own feelings that are welling up in them that they're not going to be really able to take in other people's feelings and other people's mindsets. So you're going to see a failure to read other people's minds, which is shown in people with psychotic illnesses, a failure to be able to read other people's minds, because they're so focused on themselves. They're not reading and taking in enough of the outside reality and what's going on for other people. On the other hand, though, if we can't access that reality simulator, we may have an incredibly strong, focused analytical intelligence but it's only going to be able to process reality in simple-minded, black-and-white ways. It will find it very hard to predict other people's behaviour because it doesn't see the deeper context for things. So it's going to be very anxious a lot of the time. It's going to have a strong need for control to try and keep the environment stable because it can't predict change, because it can't see the complexities of the interacting variables. So it's going to be very controlling, very rigid, very black-and-white in thinking, difficulties getting along with people, but capable of doing immense acts of focus and of analytical intelligence as well. So we can see that these two new understandings, or these human givens understandings of both psychosis and Asperger's and indeed autism, that having good organizing ideas really points towards a better methodology of treatment. Once we understand what's not working well and what's working well, it enables one to be able to gear to treatment much more accurately. Once you understand that people with Asperger's have difficulty getting into their imagination, suddenly you understand why they would be poor with guided imagery, don't you? Because guided imagery is getting people into the REM state. 
And although they may be able to get them visualized, you don't be surprised if you don't, for example, um, get a great deal of success with the rewind technique, even if you're getting them into, the, into their visual imagination. Because they're not doing autobiographical memory. They're not linking up a personal memory. They're not doing, creating a personal story that's linked, a, self, a concept. They're not going into their mind to develop a, a, an enriched self-concept that links all their memories together, etc. So you're going to find it difficult with people with this condition getting out specific memories. Because their memory system won't be wired that way through self-concept. Equally with people more on the imaginative spectrum who are undisciplined by reason, You can do all the cognitive therapy you want. But don't be surprised after you take them step by step through a reasoned argument <laughs> that they completely lose it in the next 10 seconds. Because something else pops into their mind and they're off. It certainly points towards treatment about the need to ground people who are overly imaginative in waking concrete reality and getting their needs met and out of their imaginations. And perhaps the reverse for people who are kytextic. Now, I want to introduce another interesting concept to you. And it is, what, how, does this, how does this default system develop over time? Does it develop over time? Does it change over time? Because this conference today is about education. And this might have a huge bearing on education the importance of this default system. Does it evolve? Does it develop over time? And the answer is, it does. Children aged 7 to 9 and adults contrast with adults, adults aged 21 to 31. And basically the default system is operational in children aged 7 to 9, much less obvious in children aged 2 to 3, but it's, it's growing in complexity and in wiring and into wiring all the time. But in children aged 7 to 9, it's much less complex than it is in adults aged 21 to 31. Here's a map of the connections between the various areas here. That's the green, see that green circle there? That's in the children. That's the same green circle here, but it's surrounded with much more complexity and interweaving, etc. So that the default system is much more complex, which is, of course, what you would expect if you're having an enriched inner life where you're doing a lot of self-reflection, taking into account and thinking about the life's impacts, developing an enriched self-concept, developing an enriched ability to read other people's minds, and that in turn reflecting back upon your own assessment of yourself, developing a capacity to imagine things that don't yet exist. Well, of course this, thing is going, this network is going to become much more complex. Interesting, one point I didn't mention when I was talking about people with, psych with, psych with psychotic symptoms, that the more severe the psychotic symptoms, the more hyper-aroused is the default system, exactly as we would expect as well. So yes, this imaginative mind, what scientists, because they're not really sure what it's all about, are currently calling the brain's default system, because it switches off when we're not externally focused. It's been called the default system, what we would call the imaginative mind, the reality simulator of the REM state, develops in complexities over time. This surely has huge implications for education. Implications, I've talked about implications for treating people on the autistic spectrum and, and on the psychotic spectrum, but also huge implications, I think radical implications for education. Because if we are not only to reduce the incidence of autism and psychosis, we, we need to be aware of these systems. Now, if, now if we're not going to reduce the incidence, but more than that, if we are to produce more creative human beings, we are facing unprecedented challenges to the human species in the coming decades. If we can't produce a better class of human, I think we're pretty well doomed. If we can't produce humans that are capable of perceiving more enriched contexts, which should be the definition of spiritual development, by the way, the capacity to perceive ever richer contexts, how things are interrelated. If we can't get that process on the way with our children and start producing a better class of human in the coming decades, well then I think we can kiss, kiss goodbye to life on this planet. So, this is an important question. It has bearings. It has huge bearings on how we think about education. We need to think about what sort of educational stimulus will stimulate the default, this, 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 this reality simulator in children in whom it's underdeveloped 
and what type of education would overstimulate it in some children because to overstimulate it is as harmful as to understimulate it. We need to ask questions about that. We need to think about what are the functions of this default system. Autobiographical memory. Do we do enough to help children promote stories about themselves? Ones that are based in reality, not in imagination. Ones that are not undermining their self-esteem or over challenging, or, or overestimating self-esteem, but that are based in realism, but an enriched perception of themselves, self-concept. Because the whole putting together of memory is dependent upon that for the reality simulator. Are we giving an education, for example, that encourages children to be able to imagine alternative futures? Because that's the second great job of the reality simulator, to be able to imagine what doesn't exist in other futures. But not so wild that it's not disciplined by some connection to reality, concrete reality, but stimulate their imaginations. Are we stimulating their imaginations? Are we developing enriched biographical memories? Are we developing and doing exercises to help them read the mindsets of others? If, we, in, if the government introduces something as radical as saying computer training should have the same importance in primary education as reading and writing, have we really thought through the implications of that for the development of the reality simulator? Because that computer training is going to be external focused. If we do that externally focused training at the cost of developing the imagination, we're going to have huge problems down the road. We're going to be encouraging the autistic spectrum disorders. And we really need to get a lot of research projects going now about how to get a balanced development of this organ in the brain because real intelligence depends upon it. And sometimes very simple things can make a big difference. I was going for breakfast this morning and I happened to be standing beside Jane there in the second row. And I said, I recognise your face, Jane, but I'm not sure who you are which is a terrible problem that Ivan and I have because we meet so many hundreds of people every week. It's difficult. If we haven't seen you in the last 24 hours, your name doesn't automatically pop into our minds. But there, there you have it. So she said, I'll give you a clue, socks. I said, no, it's not ringing any bells for me. <laughs> and then she said, knitting. And I said, I have you. You were the lady who knitted throughout the last conference. She said, I am. <laughs> And I'm going to be knitting throughout this conference, she said. <laughs> That's a curious behavior, I said. Tell me, why do you do that? And she said, I find I can't concentrate on the lectures unless I knit. She said, I think I'm probably a kinesthetic sort of person. And if I don't knit, I find myself doodling. And if I doodle, I'm off in my imagination. I lose the content of the lecture. But by having the knitting going on, it keeps me sufficiently external fo externally focused to be able to process the lecture. And there is a very simple, practical little behaviour that hugely aids learning for a person whose mindset too easily wanders into the imagination, keeping it grounded in an external reality. Very simple thing. We can understand it now from the theories that I've covered here this morning, why that would actually work and why it would be such a useful little practical thing to do. But it's those sort of practical interventions that we need to get more and more of and understand why. Once you've got organising ideas, you can understand why things work. The ideas that I've put forward here this morning, which I and I have partly written up and, if we ha and, and the rest will be written up in the near future, those ideas have huge implications for understanding autism and autistic spectrum disorders, for understanding psychosis, for the treatment of these disorders. And as important as that is, I believe their greater importance is their implications for the future education of our children. <laughs>